welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast about the classical world, ancient books, ancient texts, classical education. Uh, there's like medieval things in here. I don't know. Sometimes we talk about movies. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we're just, we're, you know, it's a podcast. I mean, come on now. You know what you're doing. Um, my name is Graham Donaldson, and I am joined by my two contemporaries, compatriots? Both? Colleagues. What does it matter? <laughs> uh, Arthur Jan Hanenberg. That's me. And Thomas Fletcher Magby. Hello. Tommy Fletch. Nope, that's not it. Um, and today I have homework, apparently. Yes. You gave me something to look at. I have a piece of blue paper with a triangle on it. Um... So I guess we're talking about the Illuminati or something. I don't know. <laughs> yes, that's exactly yep. <laughs> uh, please uh, start by drawing an eye inside of that pyramid that I put in front of you. Already done. Okay. Wait, is that actually true? <laughs> no. no just that kidding. Somehow wouldn't surprise me. Um, is that the Illuminati theme song? What are you doing? No, right no, there? no. I just realized I was I was helping the Godfather. Oh. Um, For any particular reason? Or? No, I don't know. I was trying to do the X Files music, but I'm still I still got the vaccine in my brain. <laughs> this is. Uh, uh, I'm sorry to hear like that. that. Yep, you did perfect. Awesome. Everyone on okay. YouTube will love it. Okay, so yes, we will be talking a little bit about Euclid today and his elements. So we started off two weeks ago at this point. I don't remember how long ago. Talking about uh, Paul Lockhart, his mathematician's lament, how there are problems with how math is taught right now. And so I wanted to take a swing at talking through, I mean, it's, you know, essentially the oldest like math textbook that we have, right? Um, Euclid's Elements. Are you Socrates and we're the slave boy? Is that what's going on? <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, yeah, and I guess we'll get to the little triangle I drew in a second, but the three letters of it are T-A-G because uh, it's, you know, our first names. It's A.J. Graham and Thomas, but I put myself as the the head point. So yeah, I'm clearly I'm the boss of this one. Um, Euclid's Elements. Uh, gentlemen, is this, you know, you, you all have gone through mathematics education before. You all uh, are well-read people. Have you all come across Euclid's Elements before? I've never read it. But you, you've heard of it before. I've heard of you're it. You're saying, yeah. Okay. Only in terms of that, yeah, I've heard of it. And then also when people talk about Euclidean geometry. Yep. But that's, that's the extent of my knowledge. So I always wondered what the elements were. If he was like an earth, air, fire, wind <laughs> kind of guy. Oh, man, I love that band. Yeah, yeah. that's my favorite band. Or... Yeah. Uh, Mm-hmm. Yep. We're actually just going to do that for the next hour. So if you want to just keep that going, that would be great. Or if he's like a helium oxygen kind of fella. What? Elements. Elements. Yes. No. Oh, got it. Good. Uh, yes, that's not not quite it, but you're you guys are on the right track. Um, so, yes. So Euclid. Uh, I mean, there are a number of collections of works of Euclid's. The Elements is his most famous uh, you all said you, you've heard of the of the elements before. What what's the subject of the elements? Maybe to take it that way. What 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 do you all know about it? It's it's geometry, but just because I've heard of Euclidean geometry. Sure, but when you're talking about the elements, I'm confused because I would think it would be chemistry. Like yeah, early early chemistry, how things are made up. Well, Earth, air, like, fire, and water. It's probably like thing. base stuff for geometry, mm. like uh, the hypotenuse, like uh, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, like that's basic stuff. That's the in elements. here. We, okay. That's uh, the end of book one gets to that. It's um, Proposition 47 out of 48. So like, we get there eventually. Basic working tools with which you can do geometry. Is that kind of what this is? Yes. Maybe that, that is probably the best way to think about it. So <laughs> it's, point, point it's, all, it's always quiz show. Quiz show never ends. We, <laughs> and we keep running tallies from... What's uh, your country? What's my... Yeah, Hannenberg. Don't worry, Thomas. I'll keep track. Thanks. I appreciate um, that. <laughs> what, what country do you uh, rule over? Hannenberg? Oh. Hannenbergundy? Oh, good. That's actually pretty good. Have you been working on that one? Nope. Good. Just cooked it up. Good. Okay, so... AJ0, or... It, wait, AJ1, Graham 0. Mm. Doesn't... Well, Graham, Donsylvania. Graham's coming oh, in with like sorry. eight points into this. Yeah. After, Donsylvania. Yeah, it carries over? I would that's like to point out that there's a place called Pennsylvania that doesn't have vampires. Not that we know of. Yeah. That's what you think. Yeah, you don't know that. How many points did you have? Eight? Oh, I'll eclipse you. Don't I thought, worry. Wait, yeah. <laughs> didn't... You kept the... You kept the points. Okay. So yes. So Euclid's elements, uh, it's a collection. So part of what's when we'll read some quotes in a second and you'll get n- different numbers of like how many books there are in here. Sometimes that's just like, it's only, um, certain books get translated and uh, you know, the book has been used for such a long period of time. Sometimes only certain of the books are like accessible or they're like renumbered differently. Um, the one sitting in front of me has 13 books in it. Some translations, again, will only go through six, but you'll see different numbers around that. 
Um, so um, it is, I guess we, yeah, calling it geometry always feels like limiting it in some strange way, but yes, it's about shapes, I guess would be the way to put that. Um, let's, I mentioned last time that Lockhart's uh, summary of geometry is that it's uh, tools of Satan, I think was the title of the, uh, the section where he talks about geometry. Do you all like geometry? I forget if we talked about that. I love time. geometry. I think it's great. I, I do not like geometry. I loved algebra. Do you remember why? Um, where, which classes you have to do the graph graphs in geometry, graph right? things. Yeah. I didn't like graphing things. Okay. Cause I always got points off cause my graph was messy. It's okay. like, who cares? I got, I did the number. I put the point on the right spot. How about following with that? Um, why does geometry exist? What is geometry for? Got to build buildings so you can uh, make things look pleasing and art use it for perspective. I will read from The Great Ideas, Mr. Mortimer Adler. The ancient opinion found in Herodotus, Plato, and Aristotle that the mathematical arts, especially geometry, were first developed by the Egyptians is of interest because of the questions it raises about the circumstances of the origin of mathematics. Herodotus seems to suggest that geometry arose as an aid in the practice of surveying land. The word geometry, what does it mean? The study of... Ooh, geometer, so... Earth measure, measure of the earth. Earth measurement. There so you that's, there you go. So surveying land, earth measurement is where geometry literally comes from. Point Hannenberg. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Two to eight. I'm coming back. But I will say, Aristotle, on the other hand, separates uh, the, from the useful arts those which do not aim at utility. Um, so there are some that are like for utility and some are just for fun. So the two like competing theories of where geometry comes from, one is land surveying, which is like literally the name. And the other is people were bored and wanted to do something with their leisure time and geometry is what they did. Why do I bring it up? Um, Euclid's elements aren't, they're not about land survey and they're not about like, so you want to build a building. Like there's no practical thing being described in Euclid's elements. It's a series of, um, prop, he's, uh, he's proving propositions one after the other. And they are, he's describing like ideal forms of shapes. He's not actually, again, there are no measurements. There are no, there aren't really numbers in this book and it's a math book. We'll get into this in a second. That's why you have a triangle in front of you. Um, I'll, I'll brief this. Um, there are 13 books um, in Euclid's elements. The first book has more of like a kind of preface section at the front. He kicks off with a list of definitions. I'm not going to read through them. He has 23 definitions in here. Um, he, t he defines a point, a line. He defines different types of triangles. All those things are a part of his definitions. What's the definition of a point? Ah, I think this is beautiful. Are you ready? A point is that which has no part. Whew. Isn't that like deep? A line is breathless, breathless length. So a point is hmm. just a point is a spot. It has no part. So you've never seen a point. You've never. Yeah, I think that's probably a true thing. So how can there be a point? It's uh, there even if you can't yeah, see you draw, it. It's on the page in front of you. you but, have, but it has no a point. Is what was it? It has no part. It has no part. That which has no part. Yeah. So it's just one whole thing. It takes up no space is the point that he's trying to make. So where I've made a little bold dot for your triangle, mm -hmm. that doesn't actually exist. There's no thing there. There's just... This is a theoretical representation of a point. And this is probably more... So I'm about to tell you that the triangle in front of you is isosceles. If you were to look at it, it's very clearly not isosceles because my drawing is really trashy. Mm -hmm. but that's I, why I got points off. Wait, what? Well, that's why I didn't like geometry. Oh, oh, oh. You could, you, what you should have done is go up to your teacher and be like, points off, huh? Well, point... Has no part. Yeah. I would like 100%. Therefore, Thank you. See that, that, uh, see that one over. How do you think that would have gone? I was too much of a rule follower. I was <laughs> goody. I, I didn't never Are you being back. a rule follower is why I think you would like uh, Mr. Euclid. Okay. Sure. So he kicks off with a line of definitions and the remainder of the elements uh, expect you to know all 23 of these definitions. So they'll be cited and referenced at different points, but you won't be able to progress in any of the propositions without first knowing the definitions. And the reason there are 13 books is that each book starts with a new set of definitions. So they, they, Oof. um, so, uh, uh, Euclid starts with a few things on circles right off the bat in book one, he'll cover more advanced shapes as he goes on. Now, are they really complicated or could you turn them into little kids songs? Like if you were going to teach this, could you turn them all into fun little kids songs that they could learn when they're like seven? And then when they get to 10th grade, they'd be like, Oh, I remember You'd have this. to rephrase them. So again, like a point is that which has no part is one of the definitions, which seems like a very simple idea, but it seems like there's a lot to that. Yeah. What actually is a point. 
which then you you English teachers want to go and talk about. But the point uh, is that um, he is claiming these things and then moving on. He's not defending any of these. Yeah, it's I'm I'm again. All we do is jump around. AJ, when you teach jump logic, up, jump up to get down. Jump up to get down. Um, in logic, isn't this also like you you have to have a starting place from which to argue? Aren't there certain things you just have to assume off the bat? Call the premise. Is that so? But are ax- there axiomatic? But I'm wondering, do you have? Yes, there's the premise, but even like the rules of how to logic. Those have been. I mean, at one point there were postulates that were proven. Like you can prove all of these things. And I guess you prove a effort. point has no. Again, it's like it, the definitions are circular. It's not worth going into. Yeah, yeah. Like sorry. there's no there's no thing to prove there. No, it's fine. But uh, the question is to like whether they you know. Many of these you would consider basic things. An obtuse angle is an angle greater than a right angle. An acute angle is an angle less than a right angle. Um, so, again, those are things that could be rephrased and put into a song. Gotcha. You're, you're saying could someone memorize these I'm things? I'm just saying that, like, if, if if he's saying you need to memorize these things before you can move on, I'm just wondering if they are easily memorizable or if they're pretty com- – like, how complicated – what's the most complicated one in the first chapter? Like, what's the last one? Um, we'll get there in a little okay. bit. So maybe you're thinking, like, for logic it would be truth and falsity. A true thing is a true thing. Like it's yes. a, it is something in actuality, but not all truths are in actuality. It seems like the only, maybe I'm wrong here, but the only way you can define truth is that it, it is true, right? So it's like a foundational thing, truth and false. This it's not worth. At some point, this gets into like philosophy of math, which is so far beyond my skis. But it's um, the what Euclid will argue is true as long as you take the assumptions at face value. Gotcha. Does that copy that? That Got might it. be the other way to say it. Is that uh, well. You all referenced Euclidean, Euclidean geometry. Um, do you all know what what does that mean? <laughs> it's a again. I know it's a term that gets thrown around. I don't know. I mean, I, this is a geometry that Euclid, Euclid did. Yes, I mean that that's what it is. So after this set of definitions, there's a set of postulates. Um, so again, these are things that he will claim. And um, what's your fun definition of a postulate? Um, you assume the existence of mm-hmm. these things. So here are the five things that he assumes the existence of, and this will play into your triangle thing. So stick with me for a little bit um, that you're able to draw a straight line from any point to any point. So two points, you can draw a line between them that you can produce a finite straight line continuously in a straight line. So um, on your triangle, you have two sides of it. You could extend that line if you wanted to um, okay. actually. And also the base could be extended if you wanted to. So that's what he's saying with the second one. Third, to describe, you can describe a, a circle with any center and a distance. And by distance, he's normally talking about a radius. Though he'll talk about diameter at some points. Um, the fourth one, that all right angles are equal to one another, which is kind of a funny one. He essentially, that's saying that 90, de- 90 degrees always equals 90 degrees. Um, and Doesn't then, 89 degrees always yes. equal 89 degrees? This, uh, you'll, you'll sometimes, there are some articles written about how the fourth postulate is the dumb one. Hmm. Um, and then um, fifth, that if a straight line falling on two, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read it and then, Give her. yeah, just uh, please glaze over as I talk. That, the yawn is also perfect, that if a straight line falling on two straight lines makes the interior angles on the same side less than two right angles, the two straight lines, if produced indefinitely, meet on that side on which are the angles less than the two right angles. And obviously, I don't have to say any more about that. Yeah, I hope on. you're enjoying your commute to work on this <laughs> podcast today. <laughs> look, if, if, we can, <laughs> if we can do episodes about like gates that people can't actually look at, then I can do one on math. So I'll have at you least know. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing? Okay, so um, what is he saying? Is um, took a chance. You did. You took a chance. Needed a great. Well, job. is great. Yes. Okay, so imagine that there are um, two lines that yep. don't connect with each other. Mm-hmm. And then you draw a straight line that connects with those two lines. Yep. The point that he's making is that the line that you've drawn through, yeah. um, the sum of that straight line on yes. both other sides of that line adds up to 180. Yep. That's what he's arguing. Um, listener, that made no sense to you. Probably on YouTube, I'll have some pictures, so get excited. Well, so, maybe I can explain it. You're looking at a uh, long set of railroad tracks, uh-huh. railroad tie across it, yes. right? Uh, so as the railroad tie crosses the yes. track... The angles that it produces All on the left and angles. right side of the track yes. ends up to 100, 180. Yes, but he he won't actually use numbers at any point in his um, elements, but that's what he's that's the easier way to understand what he's arguing. Cool. Um, that fifth assumption isn't always true. So um, 
um, with AJ's example of railroad um, crossings, that assumes a flat surface. But mm-hmm. if I if there's any curve on like if it's going over a hill, mm-hmm. it's not going to add up to 180 degrees because it's gotcha. not a flat surface. Does that make sense? It does make sense. So the difference between Euclidean and non-Euclidean geometry is is Euclid right? So if the five postulates of Euclid are correct, you're doing Euclidean geometry. If any of them are wrong, you're, you're doing, doing non- physics. Or you're doing yes. you're doing something in. Like it could be uh, there's spheres. abstract there's abstract math that is just non Euclidean. Your plane isn't flat. You're gotcha. um, dealing with a, a curved plane. Essentially, could be one way of doing or it. The astral plane. Yep. Um, all yep. All forms of astrology are non Euclidean <laughs> geometry. Yep. That was a good one, Donaldson. Thanks, point, Donaldson. Yeah. Wait, hold on. Hold on. Wait, hold on. This is my episode. Do I get to give the points? I, I mean, wait, you, do, you want, do you want to take one away? Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> wait. Dalton, back down to eight. Oh. Right. This is so satisfying. Okay, so uh, that... The people of Dalsylvania cry out. <laughs> at, the, at the injustice. Uh, unfortunately, wait, can I give myself points? <laughs> it's your show, man. Um, no, actually, I want to give Graham his point back. That would make me feel better. About back to this. nine, buddy. Oh, good. Yes. Okay, so... Where are we right now? We're in Euclid's elements. He starts off with a list of definitions. Um, in this first part, he's defining very basic things, points, lines, circles, triangles. These are shapes you've seen before. In later books, he gets into like the weird stuff, but we're not quite there yet. Um, following the definitions, he has a set of postulates. And again, these are things that he is just assuming to be true. It's related to definitions, but they're separated helpfully because they're not always true. So for anything in Euclid's elements to be true, these postulates have to be true also. So there's your fun fact. Um, And then he has a set of um, common notions, and he'll introduce other ones um, later. I'm not going to – I'll just read through them to give examples of them. Um, One, things which are equal to the same thing are also equal to one another. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Things which are equal to the same thing are also equal to one another. That, that's just a common notion? Yes. That sounds more like than just a common notion. That so? sounds like a law. If um, A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. That's like... But he doesn't have to define it's it. It's not just a notion. But isn't that a... Um, is it a tautology? Like, it's a thing that just, like, he is just... Re- he's just saying this is a true thing. Hmm. And I guess is providing more evidence for it than his definitions. Okay. Is that fair? I don't... Okay. Um, if equals be added to equals, the whole are equals. So if you add A and B together, that equals the sum of A and B. Is that um, if equals be subtracted? To, <laughs> good. If equals be subtracted from equals, the remainders are equal. So again, if you um, subtract two from eight, that will equal eight minus two. Uh, things which coincide with one another are equal to one another. So things that are the same length are the same length. I can't say that he's blowing my mind right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> thank this you. Is, good. Uh, <laughs> but, but this is, but this, okay, thank you. That's actually the perfect point. And then the whole is greater than the part. How do you like that, right? So nothing is like inc- um, small part plus small part equals big part. That's his fifth one. Okay, so none of these are like earth shattering. And even, again, he calls those common notions, which maybe is the right term. They're like obvious things. It almost feels silly to have written them down. Okay, but he'll start from a set of very... Um, um, either given statements or very obvious statements. And then um, over the course of 13 books get to like, like how do you describe the area of a 13 sided shape or like, like he gets into weird stuff by the end of it. All he has started with are these definitions and postulates and common notions. And then the purpose, what follows after that are the propositions and each proposition is using proofs to show that something is true. And that's the, If you ever see that expression QED, that's what QED means. It's prove it's um, you've proved that which you set out to prove. And so that's what he does. He, he, he makes a statement as to what he wants to prove. And then he goes on to show that something is true. Okay. Um, I want to pause right there because last time we talked about, again, mathematicians lament about the badness of giving things, people giving people things to memorize and then just having them regurgitate. Oh, you didn't want me to memorize those. (laughs) This is unfortunate. (laughs) I would be impressed if you did, but doesn't this sound like we're essentially doing that? We're giving people a set of definitions Mm -hmm. and then you have to memorize them and then apply literally that definition to each problem. Yep. I I just wanted to have any thoughts on this as we go into it. I mean, so far they're not, we're not um, memorizing the conclusion. Like, a squared plus B squared equals C squared. We're memorizing just definitions of like the tools that you're going to need. That, that feels different. Because we'll eventually reason our way into yeah. 
um, the Pythagorean theorem yes. as opposed to just being given being that. given the Pythagorean theorem and then told how to apply it in in, in problems. Yes, but I think my point last time was that math has gone so far that many of those things have to be the assumed thing now. Like our our time of here are the things that you have to assume goes further, and then when we get to the actual reasoning is later. But many of us might not ever actually reach the reasoning is the problem. And students do some of it, like they have to prove um, they have to prove things in geometry. Yes, which, which again is like it's because of Euclid that that's the case because that's how he teaches geometry. <laughs> Uh, I, I guess I'm wondering whether that's good or bad. So, again, things are presented as givens, and you like that a middle schooler can just be given a squared plus b squared equals c squared, just to take an example, as opposed to needing to learn 46 propositions until the 47th, which is the Pythagorean theorem. What are, like, give me just thoughts on one versus the other. Well, is. Uh Euclid's saying that this is the way that you need to learn it. Like he's writing a textbook, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those are his lecture notes. That is correct. That is correct. That, that you're saying there are other ways. I'm to saying learn. there's ways you can teach it. Now there's, there's the book of like what it is, but yes. you don't have to teach it that way. You don't have to, but, but you're saying that AJ Hannenberg, you mentioned that math is important. You mentioned this in the, um, what's the thing called Republic. Isn't it the Republic? Do you remember what they said about math? Study it for 30 years and then move on to other things. Um, that was then eventually taken even further than that. That over Plato's symposium was a sign that originally read, let no one come to our school who has not uh, studied geometry. And that sign was eventually updated. They claimed that the Greek philosophers used to post upon the doors of their schools the well-known notice, let no one come to our school who has not learned the elements of Euclid. So geometry wasn't enough. The geometry wasn't enough that to study philosophy, one needed Euclid. Mm. Not so. Not only geometry, but the way that Euclid presents it. Can we do that in our like entrance examinations? Should we like? Can we have that over our door? Let no one school? come to Veritas. <laughs> you could <not> <laughs> study Euclid. Euclid. You could do that. Uh, you would limit your number of people um, to like two. Yeah, <laughs> if like even right. Nerdy homeschools. Yeah. Well, uh, but Thomas is uh, uh, my child. Your child. <laughs> yeah. He'll be the only one. I love Euclid. Or he'll hate Euclid very much. Um, okay. So you're saying, is this the only way to learn it? The answer is no, but it was, you know, Plato Symposium. So not just math people, but like. Uh, sure. People will just, people will send us angry emails, but like philosophy people still thought there was value to how geometry is taught here and Euclid's instantiation of how to teach geometry. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That does make so sense. whether Euclid thinks it or not, philosophers for, you know, thousands of years thought so. Um, maybe just to continue on with this train of thought. So Euclid writes this somewhere around like 300 BCE. And um, this Euclid remains the geometry textbook for 2200 years 2300 years um there's a charming story of uh, abraham lincoln uh who uh, went to law school and wasn't like a very good lawyer he had trouble he had trouble in law school like formulating his arguments and how he wanted to or um whatever well, the best way to present evidence i guess was one way to say it um so this is him writing um i said to myself what do i do when i demonstrate more than when I reason or prove, how does demonstration differ from any other proof? I consulted all the dictionaries and books of reference I could find, but with no better results. At last I said, Lincoln, you can never make a lawyer if you do not understand what demonstrate means. And I left my situation in Springfield, went home to my father's house and stayed there till I could give any proposition in the six books of Euclid at sight. Hmm. I then found out what demonstrate means and went back to my law studies. So, you know, this is Dang. separated by that's, um, 2000 years. So who's the guy that was like, you know what? I'm going to write another geometry textbook. <laughs> we don't need you. There Euclid. are lots of people who think that, um, do you want to, but if you said this was the geometry textbook for 2200 years, who was like the 19th century dude that was like, you know what? Let's just modernize, update this for our, um, there are, uh, 12 or 13 of them that were like leading, um, opposition to, um, Euclid, sorry, I didn't have this pulled up right now. Um, Lewis Carroll, mm. um, uh, do you all know anything about this fellow? Lewis Carroll, the writer of 
The new Alice in Wonderland? Yes. Do you know anything about him? Yeah, he was like, he loved uh, psychedelics. Oh, that not the direction we're going, but yes. Um, Have you ever read the Alice in Wonderland? Uh, yes, but not recently. Hmm. Uh, uh, Lewis Carroll, Lewis Carroll is not the guy's name. The guy's name is Charles uh, Dodgson, and Charles Dodgson is a mathematician. That's mm-hmm. what he did by trade. So in addition to Alice in Wonderland, of which for which he is known, um, in addition to Jabberwocky and other things, he wrote a play called Euclid and his modern rivals where Euclid is resurrected and essentially verbally jousts his, uh, um, I think it's actually only three people in the play. It's Euclid, this like modern mathematician and essentially two mathematicians who are arguing whether Euclid is good or not. Mm -hmm. Um, one person who thinks he's good, one person who thinks he's bad. Um, but like literally the play is referencing these modern textbooks that are attempting to, replace Euclid. Yeah, yeah. Your question is why do you want to like take a swing at it? No, like, I know why. Why? Oh, it's just cuz they cuz it's just prejudice against old things. It could be that. Um or it's also cuz the what you were reading right there sounds impossible for a Thank ninth you. grader yeah. to understand and we have to teach it to ninth graders. Yes. So, um let's <clears throat> yes. I guess maybe this is the time to jump into um we're going to try and talk through one of these propositions to make both points of Let's do it. There's a rigor to what Euclid is doing. It's kind of obtuse and difficult, not obtuse and ha. Huh, see what I did there? All these math jokes, guys. Aren't you a cutie? <laughs> also, Graham, I got a point for knowing why they reach up to uh, the I know who Lewis Carroll is. Yeah, you oh, didn't know that's that. That's fair. Okay, good. Give, you want to no, give I knew who you? Lewis Carroll was. Yeah, you both. Yeah, he said That's that a point, Hindenburg. He said that first. Psychedelics. I didn't like your answer. Uh, Can you take a point away from Graham? I can't. That was a tangent <laughs> that I didn't need on this episode. <laughs> it is now this, eight to four. This point I'm, system is going directly to my head. Just do you know the how many are I s- caused on this podcast? No, I was going to say, uh, there's more I could have caused. Fine. Was that a threat? No, that was a threat. I think that was a threat. Seven. Yeah, Aww. let's take that point down. Right. Okay. <laughs> so um, proposition five um, has a charming name. Um, I'm going to give you the Latin name. Okay. Um, the Latin name, I'm going to butcher. Get excited, all you listeners. The Pons Asinorum is the name of this. <laughs> Do you know what that means? No, I'm five. I'm sorry. Wait, why are you laughing? It's... Never mind. Okay. Um, uh, I'm not going to translate it because it's a funny translation. But um, What is it? I, I, will I regret this? It's the Donkey Bridge. This is the Donkey Bridge. Cool. But it's... I laughed because of... A-S-S. 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 Yeah. Donkey. Well, just to be clear, what I pronounced was A-S-I-N-O-R-U-M. That's just to be, anyway. But that is, it's the Donkey Bridge. And um, there are different, there are competing theories as to why it's called the Donkey Bridge. One is that the thing you're about to draw will kind of look like a bridge. Um, the other, is, apparently this is like a, a, a phrase that um, a pons asinorum is the point at which many learners f- uh, fail, especially a theory or formula that is difficult to grasp. So, mm-hmm. um I should be. Um, so the question is, which one of us is a donkey? Uh, no, no. All three of us are the donkey. Let's be very clear. <laughs> um, I'm, 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 no, you're the bridge builder. Ah, thank you. Good. I must give my um, thanks to the quote I just read for from Lincoln. I found via the Afterthoughts blog. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, the thing about Pons Asinorum, I found through uh, uh, SCL. Uh, I think it's Aaron Cow had a uh, lecture a few years ago about Euclid's elements that I found very helpful. So thank you to both of you. Okay, so this is kind of a um, the point that Cal makes in his lecture is that this uh, proposition is the one that like if you can't make it through this, you're probably not made for math, right? So that's the it proves who are the donkeys and who are the horses. Cool. You know what I mean? So again, we don't have. Can we do that. We should do that in class. <laughs> it feels wrong to say that. Exam like, right there. You need to be like up to the challenge. This is how we sort for the houses. Oh my word! <laughs> We've had students say that they want to have like a like a training week of some kind, and then like a selection at the end of it. And I both hate the idea and love the idea. Right? Like in like a draft. Almost? Yeah, a draft. A, 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 literally a draft. But a house draft. But it's not just an athletic draft because because academics matter, fine arts matter. There are all kinds of things. It's a good idea. Except except for whoever's the last one picked. That's always the problem. So just throwing that out there. How's that a problem? It's bad. You don't to want to be last picked <laughs> students at all because that's bad. Okay. They'll cry for days. Yeah. Why are you in favor of students crying, Graham? That's my question. Okay. So get, get um, good. Get good. <laughs> indeed. Um, so teaching through talking through this proposition will be made a slightly difficult by me changing some of the letters. Um, so listeners, um, if you're on YouTube, I'll try and put a picture of this up, but we are, I want to beat AJ. You won't. Um, uh, because neither, I don't know if either of you will get to it. I'm going to end up just like reading a lot of things. Let's do it. Um, so 
Um, we're starting with a triangle. Okay. In this triangle, uh, a triangle has three points. That's one of the oh, definitions. I'm lost already. And the top, so there, the three points are T, A, and G. Mm-hmm. For the purpose of our, uh, the picture that is in front of me, but that listener you cannot see, T is the top point, A is the bottom left point, G is the bottom right point. Um, we will talk through this probably for the next 10 minutes or so, so stick with me is my kind way of saying that. Okay, so first thing that is true just definitionally, this is an isosceles triangle. What is an isosceles triangle? Right and left sides are equal. Yes. So on your uh, point, Hanover. on <laughs> on your triangle, the side TA is equal to the side TG, and that's definitional. You don't have to prove anything there. Um, now there might be another thing that you know about isosceles triangles. Um, there's angles A and G are equal. So TAG is equal to angle TGA. Now you know that because of Euclid. You don't know that at this point in the elements. Does that make sense? Mm. The thing we're trying to prove right now is that TAG, the angle TAG, equals the angle TGA. Mm. So let me read the formal version of it. Um, Each proposition starts with the proposition that it's setting out to prove. In isosceles triangles, the angles at the base are equal to one another. And if the equal straight lines be produced further, the angles under the base will be equal to one another as well. So... If I were to draw a line beyond TA, there's an angle something AG that's equal to the extended line on the other side. Does that make sense? Okay, so what we're setting out to prove is that the angles are the same. How, what would you, so the question is, how would, is what would you do? Can I tell you your options? You can extend lines, you can add points, and you can um, connect points with a line. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay, so what would, again, like I have a series of steps right here, but we're, you know, we're just playing. We're just having fun. What would you do to try and prove this? That TAG and TGA are equal? Yes. Oh, gosh. Mm. Get out a protractor. <laughs> so thank you. So um, actually, <clears throat> no, thank you for saying that. So at one level, um, you would want to just like actually look at the image on the paper. But the thing is, even if we printed it, the statement wouldn't be true, right? We can't draw that. I just told you T T a is equal to T G. I can't draw that picture unless I'm like very precise. Yeah. Why can't I just do that? And like make 150 isosceles triangles and measure them and then get enough data to be like, Hey, listen, that is one way of, that is one way of doing it. And, um, so again, I'm studying, but it's not a proof. That's just, it's not a proof. That's, that's the thing to say. So yeah. we're, we're dealing with things. Um, part of what's fascinating about Euclid, these are all a priori. A priori. The, you don't have to see any triangles to know that these are true things. Mm-hmm. You could go out and measure triangles with the downside being, but even if you measured every single triangle yes. that you could ever create, you still haven't proven it. Graham, AJ, before we go any further, I want to thank our Patreon sponsors for making this episode possible. Uh, Our Patreon sponsors support us at one of four levels. I'm going to go through them right now because I think many people listening, they want to be a part of this as well. They want to become patrons as well. Uh, We have a $2 a month tier. Those are Ghibellines at $2 a month. You get access to all of our episodes ad-free. You also get access to previous uh, uh, content that we've done mostly at uh, conferences, um, so you get ap- uh, access to many other uh, bonus episodes as well. At $10 a month, you get access to our our uh, in-between episodes, which we record after every single episode that we record. You also get access to our monthly AMAs, which I think are really funny, and some of our best content. In addition to all the same benefits at the $2 a month tier, you get access to ad-free episodes. Above that, at the $20 a month tier, you... Uh, at that point are giving input into the podcast. You are helping us come up with future topics to come up with future merchandise. In addition to all benefits from the tiers below that. And finally, and you heard about this uh, in recent episodes, we have added a Helios acolytes of love tier at $100 a month at this level. You are a true believer and you are the most faithful of our listeners at this tier. You get all the benefits from lower tiers. You also get, I can't believe I'm saying these words that you get a Helios Acolytes of Love crew neck sweatshirt. You get Helios Acolytes of Love Crocs and you get uh, 
uh, a free uh, copy of all future merchandise as we create it. So incredible, incredible benefits at this, at this level that is only for $100 a month. You can find all of this at patreoncom slash classical stuff. Thanks again to our patrons and um, thank you all for listening because there's no such thing as an isosceles triangle. There's no real isosceles triangle because you can't, one side will always be short. Like right. to make that, to be that precise is very difficult is mm-hmm. what I'm trying to say to the, to, like, yeah. Uh, does that make, does the point no, I'm making I had to draw sense? them in school with a ruler. Yeah, but you weren't exactly precise. Centimeters. But even your ruler was wrong if you think about it. Like mm. the, the- You've never actually seen a real triangle. Right. Or, <laughs> No, I'm serious. He's right. So You've these, never seen a true triangle. We're dealing with ideals of triangle. There's your fun one, listener land. Um, so just to say that. So one instinct would be just measure it. And that's in like modern like probability and math. That's simulation theory. So instead of knowing about a probability distribution, you just simulate it over and over again. Mm-hmm. That's a way of answering it. But it's not a way of doing it by proof, which is Euclid's approach. Gotcha. So. We have a triangle, TAG. We're trying to prove that angle TAG equals a- angle TGA and that the angle on the other side of the base also equals each other. All right. Well, um, I can draw a line from T that goes all the way down and cuts AG, the, the, the line AG in half. So, yes, you're going to bisect that angle. I'm going to bisect that angle, okay. right? So then in theory, angle T is half. By definition. So, so I've, I've now created two triangles. Yes. What do you want to call that point at the bottom? Uh, I will call that point C. Okay. So I'm calling that point C. Yes. And so now TCG, by definition, needs to equal 180. You're using numbers which Euclid doesn't. Fine. But TCG yes, needs, to, needs to, well, needs to equal, well, how, how else would you say it? Well, let's take it by proof. So um, TG... I already know equals T A, correct? Um, yes. So, uh, and if I've bisected angle T, A T G, then yeah, then then T, uh, it's always going to be half, right? Yes. So okay. A C equals A G. Yes. Um, b- by function of I've um, if ha- if the angle is cut in half, then the side on the other side is correct in half. There's um, again, I'm not using fancy names. I'm not well versed in Euclid enough to do it, but that's and, definitional. And so then. Since I know that those that all um, interior angles of a triangle need to are going to be equal to all interior angles of every other triangle, and I know that angle C, uh, uh, angle ACT is going to be ninety degrees, so it's going to be a right angle. Yes. Then, um, and and since the and since the T angle at the top on both those triangles is going to be the same then G and A need to be the same for the yeah. triangle to equal itself. It's not guaranteed to be a right triangle. That's okay. exact for bisecting it. That first off that's correct. So this is not how Euclid solves it. This is how a modern this is how modern geometry textbooks do it. Just oh, yeah. so I say it. Um, just to follow with what so you're am saying. Am I wrong? Uh, yeah, yes, but you did it gracefully. Um, so um, this <laughs> This is how I was taught geometry. I know. Well that's part of the point. Oh. So again with the postulate of um, um, all right angles equal one another. You're assuming ACT equals GCT because all right angles are equal to one another. Correct. Um, be- I drew it real straight. <laughs> yep, you sure did. But if the if the bottom is at an angle, you yeah. can still bisect that bottom line, having this angle be equal. It's not an isosceles it triangle, bro. At that point. Oh, is that? Oh, yeah. We're assuming isosceles, isosceles. Is assumed. That's right. Yes. Okay. I'm a um, dum dum. You're not a dum dum. Um, so I, I do believe what you're, you're doing. You're an <laughs> My donkey. Minus points for both of us. You're whoa, wrong. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're wrong. You're wrong. And I'm, I'm wrong, wrong too. I proved it. Minus points. You did technically prove it. So um, you would say it, you would do it by saying that angle A, um, ATG equals ATC and GTC. Correct. And um, since it's bisected, they're equal. Mm-hmm. Since all right angles are equal to each other, mm-hmm. ACT equals GCT. They're mm-hmm. both right. Which means, by definition, the remainder is TAC and TGC. Mm-hmm. Listener, this means nothing to you, but we just proved it. That's it's one everything to, to me. Good. I'm on the point. Um, <laughs> so that is that is a way to do it. That is not the way Euclid does it. That Euclid does it. So how else can you do it? How else, indeed? So um, let me redraw it on my piece of paper, and then I'll start reading us through uh, Euclid's answer to this. So. Um, I'll remind you that we are both trying to prove that the lower left and lower right angles are equal, but also trying to prove that the angle on the other side of the base is equal. So let's start. 
by extending the line. All right. So TA is going to be extended even further to the bottom left, and I'm going to call a further out point C. Um, okay. I also need to then extend um, TG to be further out, so I'm going to call that further out point D. So okay. TG. So at this point, it looks like I'm, I'm going to try to translate these shapes so the Thank listeners you. can understand. Them. This looks like a big candy corn, kind of, without a bottom. <laughs> candy corn, no bottom. It's got a it's got a triangle tip with big long sides. So this is part of why it's called bridge. Is that like uh, a mountain? Yeah, you no, call it a big letter A. You could call it that too. Yeah, candy, if you're not creative and don't candy love Halloween. Corn. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> this is hilarious. Um, but you don't need to connect C and D at the bottom. Just so it, so it's uh, there. There are these like big legs that go up toward a, a mountain top. I guess okay. you could say. It does look like the letter A. Um, Graham's right. He's never right. How dare you say something like that? Point. Um, uh, no point. I get a point for creativity. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, <laughs> so we've extended both of our lines. Um, um, so what we are setting out to prove is that the angle TAG is equal to TGA, mm-hmm. and the angle uh, I, I, GAC is equal to AGD. That's what we're setting out to prove. Yes. So what we're going to add. I'm, again, mostly I'm reading through this. We'll logic okay. through it as we come across it. And, and he's it. not, he doesn't want to say that those are 180. Like he's just nope. going to, okay. He will not use any numbers because he likes to keep things fun. So um, we're going to add a point. Um, uh, what's our next number? Our next letter. We've done C and D, correct? So we're, e. we're going to add E. So along AC, so in the bottom half of our candy corn, mm-hmm. we're going to add a point. What would you say it is? E? E. Okay. And on point E. Because it's the next one in the alphabet. It's a, it's a, we're going to uh, add a point E to be taken at random on BD. And from... Oh, man. Oh, and then on the other side, we're going to do the same thing. H. Yes. So we're giving our letter, letter A knees. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's got yes. little dots in the middle little of each dot leg. Knees. It is along little the bottom. Knees. Mm-hmm. And then we are going to, and let the, we're going to add a straight line. Uh, we're going to connect E and G. E and G? Yes. You, you don't mean E and H. I do not mean E and H. You mean E and G? Yes. And then we're going to connect A and H. So we've made a bunch of triangles. It looks like an oil tower. It does look, it does like, look like an oil tower. Or like, like, uh, like an old Derek. Or like a, again, this is the bridge. Like the Eiffel Tower. Oh, this is the bridge? This is the donkey bridge? Yes. So the bridge is A, G, and the support of that bridge is E, G, which is a diagonal line, and A, H. A. H. Okay. Or HA, whichever one you want to call it. Gotcha. Okay. So we just added those lines. Um, so A, um, a uh, no, sorry. See, I changed all the letters, which was my mistake. Now I've made Euclid harder. Why, why would I think this is a good idea? I always like to point out that I proved it a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me keep going through it. Um, so um, TE. TE. Is mm-hmm. the one. So from the very top of our triangle to. The I have knee, it, like, to the knee of the A. To the knee of the A. But not the A, not the point A, <laughs> the big letter A. This is going really well, right? <laughs> that line is equal mm-hmm. to our other side, TH. So we picked a random point put to put E. We match that random point with H. Okay. Therefore, the length of TE is the same as the length of TH. Dope. So from the top of the head to the knees yes. is the same on both sides. On both sides. So on a body, yes. Hopefully your knees are in the same place on both sides. Um, Mine aren't. I, is that actually true? I don't know. I think I got one leg shorter than the other. Um, Moving on. <laughs> we also already know that TA is equal to TG, right? Because yep. it's an isosceles triangle. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, A, E, and G, H are going to be equal. A, E, and G, H are equal to each other. So I'm marking that on here also. That's one of the postulates from before. We've subtracted the same amount from both sides, gotcha. which means the remainder is the same on both okay. sides. Um, so that means that those um, the two sides... F, A, and A, C are equal to, and the G, A, how much fun are you having right now? They contain a common angle, and the common angle is E, T, H. So E, T, H is the common angle. Is that Ethereum? Isn't E, T, H Ethereum? Yep. Oh, oh E, T, H. F coin. Good. I, I've been worried about what letters we're going to spell as we go through this. So. That's why we took the F out. Yeah. yeah they're, they're correct. There is, not, there is not an F in here. Um, okay. So that's our common angle. Therefore, the base E G, mm-hmm. hold please, is equal to the base G B, is equal to A H. So E G mm-hmm. is equal to A H. Mm-hmm. 
So the crisscross beams on the Eiffel Tower and are the tr- equal. And the triangle, T-E-G, is yep. equal to the triangle... T-A-H. T-A-H or T-H-A, either way. Okay. So the one from the top of the head to the hip on one side and the knee on the other. Yeah, they're both knees. And the remaining angles will be equal to the remaining angles respectively, namely those which the equal sides... Um, so T-E-G okay. yes. is going to be equal to T-H-A. Yes. So we have overlapping triangles. We've okay. gone from one triangle at the top, we've extended our lines, and now we have these two overlapping, um, they might be right triangles, but they don't have, we have these two overlapping triangles at the top gotcha. of our donkey bridge. Um, donkey bridge. Donkey bridge. So we have set all, we have, sent, we have two uh, identical triangles laying on top of each other. Mm-hmm. That's what's happening right here. Um, so then we have the angle, AC, uh, I think I already said this, TGE, is equal to T A H. Again, this is all because they're all equal angles and the angle A. Yeah, I already just said that. So all these angles are equal to each other. These two triangles are equal to each other. And since the whole of, I already said this also, I think that T E is equal to T H. Yep. And then, Oh, we already did the part about those two sub points being similar to each other. Um, therefore the two sides a, E, and G, H. I literally already said this. I'm getting, I'm, I'm ahead of Euclid. I'm feeling like a genius right now. And the angle, angle B, F, C. So then also the lower angle is the same. A, E, G is equal to G, H, A. Sorry, listeners. I'm probably, mm-hmm. we're almost at the very end of this one, I promise. Um, therefore, the triangle B, F, C. No, already did that one. The remaining, yep, yep, yep. Accordingly, since the whole angle T A H. I promise we're there. Was proved equal to this to the other angle that's next to it. Um, I'm just gonna. Can I? Can I? Uh, the point I'm trying to get across is like how he reasons through this. I'm gonna use his letters through the rest of this just to like read it, and then we're gonna reflect on this because it's anyway. Accordingly, since the whole angle um, T A H was proved equal to the angle T G E. Mm-hmm. And in these case, and in these, the angle G A H mm-hmm. is equal to the angle A G E. Yeah, the remaining angle T A G is equal to the remaining angle T G A T G A because you're taking away equal amounts from both sides, and both yes. sides are equal. Is that yeah. correct? And they are at the base of the triangle A B uh, T A G. They're yeah. at the base of that top triangle, but the angle F B. Uh, E A G was also proved equal to the angle E G A E G H and they are under the base. Therefore our original proposition in in isosceles triangles, the angles at the base are equal to one another. And if the equal straight lines be produced further, the angles under the base will be equal to one another. That's his conclusion. Because you're, you're like essentially draws a larger triangle that he proves are equal and then takes away smaller chunks to make, show that those smaller portions are equal. So yeah, you, um, he adds to the drawing and then um, shows things that are equal about it to make then a statement about the original triangle. So what Graham did originally is a much simpler way of proving this point. You, you stick with your triangle that you have, you draw one line, you prove the whole thing. Euclid, not interested in that. Um, and want, and is only allowing himself to use the tools of the definitions that he's given himself already to then get to a very roundabout solution. Okay, give me a reflection on our last 15 minutes of me stumbling through letters that I changed. This reminds me of, so have you guys ever seen Primer? It's a movie. Mm-hmm. It's a great movie. Yes, you watched it at BMC as a palate cleanser, didn't you? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's sure. great, yeah. but there's one part where he talks about, so two different space races and one, I think it was NASA that decided to write a use a pen that could write in zero gravity and spent like a million dollars figuring out how to make a zero gravity pen because the gravity wouldn't suck the ink out. When the Soviets just used a pencil. Yeah. <laughs> um, sure. Graham's way feels like the pencil way. Ah. And Euclid's feels like the zero gravity pen way. Mm-hmm. I don't like this. I feel like the donkey here. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take away a point for myself and give one to Graham. Yes. Wait. Oh, but why would that make you a donkey? I didn't figure it out. Oh, but you're kind of not supposed to. Again, in the SCL lecture I referenced a while ago, the um, Aaron Kausman's like, I want to say he said two weeks on this proposition in like sometimes the kids don't get to it so us spending 15 minutes versus two weeks you shouldn't feel bad about it he's not a kid 
He's a grown man. Sure, but still, 15 minutes is like a pretty short amount of time. And also, like, none of the letters made sense, and all of our listeners are like, but why? So, yes, thank you. It sounds like Euclid is saying, okay, here are here are the rules. This is the box. I'm not going to leave the box. Yes. I'm going to use all of these rules and see what I can prove. Yes. Um, You're saying that what I did, I... I use some sort of outside knowledge of something because I kept saying things like, we all know interior angles of triangles need to equal 180. Yes. And you're saying that I'm bringing out we stuff outside the box. We don't, we don't quite know that. Um, Euclid's writing as like degrees are being like measured as a unit. Yeah. So that's not necessarily a given thing as like what the, there's something inside of this triangle, but we don't know what it is. Yeah. And we haven't proven gotcha. that all of these angles. So I'm begging the question. I'm like yes. taking, I'm like saying, well, because we know right. this. In the my, same way that yeah, yeah. I think most listeners probably heard, we want to prove that the angles are the, are equal inside of an isosceles triangle. We just know that. Yeah. Well, we don't actually know that. And we have to have a way of proving that. And the, we already know that is what Euclid does later on. So because you do the work of proposition five, you can just reference it later. You don't have to prove this all over again. Gotcha. But, but you can't, but you're saying that, um, not Lockhart. What's the, it was Lockhart. It's Lockhart. Yeah. So Lockhart, Lockhart's beef is that we don't spend the time in class to go through having, so the kids proving yes. preposition, was it preposition? No, proposition, um, proposition five. Yes. Um, we just give them the conclusion and yes. then make them run problems. Yes. Now, Lockhart would not be like a huge fan of like, let's start with the definitions, right? Sure. So that's the, we didn't go into it and, um, you know, uh, time runs through our hands, but, um, like, uh, it's poetic. Thanks. But starting with these, like, you must memorize definitions at some sense, geometry is going to be taught at the high school level. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the high school, we talk about a school of rhetoric, but requiring definitions feels more like a grammar level of, um, to be teaching. Correct. I think that's why you're saying teach the definitions when they're little yeah. and then show them how it works together yeah. later. Kids but, love singing songs. Yes. But essentially you would need them to memorize it 10 years before they use it. Exactly. Is what I'm yeah. But I don't know if that does that work. Sure. I, and I, sure yeah. So this is called the donkey bridge because this is the problem wherein if the student is just lost at the end of the proof. You're like, all right, well, you can go do you're not art. going to art. <laughs> yes. Well, but not because art is very mathematical. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yes. But you're probably not going to be good at like at math. If, if you can't cross over this, this is the weed out class of Euclid's geometry. I love it. Yes. Um, and again, to the point that that's like an expression, which is kind of interesting. The first ones are about circles and I probably should have done them because they're easier. It's like, how do you draw an equilateral triangle? And you just, you make two overlapping circles. That's how you make an equilateral triangle. Because anyway, you make the, this is not worth going into. Do a Venn diagram? Yes. And if you, if your radiuses are the same on the two circles, you can make a equilateral triangle. There's your fun fact for the day. Um, um, I'm with you on your analogy, AJ, of the zero gravity pen versus the pencil. The question is, will you come up against situations where a pencil doesn't work? And again, this all, all analogies fall apart. Yeah, it's not a perfect analogy, but I, I see what you mean. And I understand the necessity of proving these postulates so that later we can rely on them. Right. Yeah, so at, at the point of you, so I, I want the, I want to make the connection to logic because in logic, the point isn't necessarily, I don't know you teach the class, not me, isn't only getting to the conclusion at the end of it. It's how, it's how you get to the conclusion. Does that make sense? Is yes. that fair? And there are even ways uh, that I teach in the second book where you can, I teach them all these mathematical operators, but you can get rid of them. Like you can get rid of a lot of operators and then eventually just get to like, if then and or, and and do all of your stuff with just those two, or I, I forget the, which ones they are, but. You mean those are the most common and you don't really need the rest of them? No, that the rest of them are some sort of combination of the others. Got it. Okay. So like, yeah, I, I could I could go over it. I'd have to relook at it, no, but there is a no. way to remove logical operators and and prove them to be basically a complicated equivalent of a simpler one. Yes, and then only use the simpler one, even though it looks much more complicated, which is useful if I ever have to program it into a really dumb computer that can't do more than one operator, right? Or if you're building out some new set of knowledge. Again, Lincoln exactly. Lincoln as a lawyer. Yeah, he. One way to become a lawyer is to just like learn the, um, pol- learn the um um the outcome of case law and just learn these are the laws, this, these are the policies, or you learn here's where this, here's what happened in this case that eventually uh, developed this precedent. Well, that's a deeper knowledge that is more sustainable than just, I memorized a bunch of stuff right now. And so that's where the point of Euclid isn't necessarily getting to like, 
I could have just told you the angles of isosceles triangles are the same, right? The two bottom angles are the same. That doesn't matter. Like who? But you were giving us first principles things, right? Yes, you were giving yes. at the beginning. You were saying like this isn't earth shattering because it's almost obvious. Yes. But from those obvious points, now we're able to do. Now we're able to prove something that is much richer than just yes. telling me the conclusion, yes. telling me the proof and saying, smart people back in the day figured this out, yes. memorize it. Yes, and then that's where, um, this is a hard book to read. Like uh, in preparation for this, it's like, it's literally lines about angles being equal to one another. So it's like mm-hmm. hard to just pick up and read. But as for something to study, to see how he's following uh, logical steps. I the think meth- there's, a, there's a methodology. There. I think there's a lot of value in that. Yeah, yeah. And again, that's the Lincoln quote. That's um, like, why do this the hard way? Well, because you're going to have to learn hard things later. Fascina Lente. Yes. And so it's, it's much more about a process here than it is about the actual geometric knowledge, though you'll pick up geometric knowledge along the way. Yeah, you, yeah. you will at the end of book one, know the Pythagorean theorem, but you're going to get there by developing it yourself, as opposed to being given a squared plus B squared equals C squared. And that's, again, that's, I think, the value of what's happening in Euclid. And I think why it lasted for so long. It's a book that is almost outside of time in that sense, that it's a thing that is still, all the logic in it still tracks 2,200 years later. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that isn't true for, like, most scientific literature, right? Sure. Um, so there's something in this that I think will last long beyond our generation, um, even though, the facts of it could be much more quickly learned. Mm -hmm. Um, The process is as necessary now as it was back then. Is that Mm -hmm. a a fair place to get to it? Um, So I don't know the, like recommending Euclid doesn't seem like the right thing. It's worth taking a look at and following, but like you can't read it. It's not, it's, it's literally a textbook. So that's fun to me. Does it want to do the summer? You actually, well, the thing, I mean, I want to do I mean, math is a huge I don't think I've done math since I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, there was a point where we were in an academic meeting and we were talking about math and someone was talking about calculus and pre-calculus. And I was just sitting there, not really in the conversation because it had to do with a a decision that I didn't really need to weigh in on. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, if somebody asked me right now, what's the definition of calculus? I couldn't give the definition of it just off the top of my head. And that shamed me. But that's, I don't know if that should in the, because. Well, I want to know what it is. But you know about math. And I took a class called calculus in high school and I don't even know what I did. It's the one where you do integrals and derivatives. Isn't yeah. that? Oh, okay. You. Um, is that you? That was me. Oh, oh, sorry. The whistle? No, me going like, nope, over my head. Oh, oh, Can't oh sorry, remember. sorry, sorry. Um, so I um, had another I've lost it. But again, you're, um, one oh, of Lockhart's points that I didn't mm. share last time is that like you won't remember most of your math knowledge anyway. So like, you, But this kind of process is a thing that if you learn. put in, there yes. are like, you know, there's probably in any given grade of 50 kids, there's like 13 or 14 kids for whom this is going to be like the meat they've always wanted, yes. right? Like that kind of rigorous process. And yes. for, there's going to be some for whom it's like, tedious yes but for some there's it's going to be like yes because it almost underlies like it underlies uh one of those like everything is learnable yeah points exactly which you know i'm always rah rah for maybe some people disagree with that um, well i always love the concept of give someone easy to understand presuppositions yes. five little points mm-hmm. and see what all these things that you all these truths of the world you can derive and and, and prove yes not just like theorize but prove from it that's very exciting but then you can also again your postulates essentially give you the toolbox Mm -hmm. and that means you can approach any one of these problems so the right way to go through this i assume is not to give students here are the propositions it's to start with here's the thing we want to prove how do you do it Mm -hmm. how would you start this problem they only have three options. Are you assuming that they would intuit the postulates because they're... No, no, no. Okay. I, I, the definitions for sure, I, th- I think the definitions need to be given. And again, I, I'm, I'm like, we should... This is probably more Patreon in between. I have my... Right? That's, that's going to be my first question to you in Patreon. But I think about like... But I just think there's a place for lecture. But I think what Euclid is doing is getting this balance right of the first two pages are lecture. You mm-hmm. need to know these things to be doing math. Mm-hmm. 
but then once you're in it, it's this exploration of, okay, we start with, here's the problem I want to do. Can I do it? Or how can I do it? And then they logic through it. So could you, uh, I'll say well, we'll do that in the yeah, end. Yeah, sure. All right. Well, do you, no, do sorry, you guys go. want your mind blown really fast? Yeah. All right. So I talked about how you can prove, I, I tried to do some remembering and proving logical operators unnecessary. So I'm going to do like one or two examples. Okay. Right. One example is an if then statement. It's an operator. It looks like a big horseshoe. So for example, if I take a shower, then I will be wet. Okay. Right? Sure. This is an equivalent phrase to an or phrase, right? So I can actually remove that operator from the mix and just work with ands and ors. So that that phrase, if I take a sho- shower, then I will be wet, is the exact same phrase is either I don't take a shower or I am wet. Okay. Right? Yeah. So either I'm wet or I didn't take or, a shower. Yeah. One of the two. Sure. Logically, those are the same phrase. Mm-hmm. So I don't actually need mm-hmm. an if-then statement operator. Mm-hmm. I can just use or. Mm-hmm. And then there's an actually a way to take ors out of the mix by turning them into ands using a thing called De Morgan's theorem. You basically invent some negatives and then like unfactor the negatives and pull them out and turn it into an and statement. So you don't really need ors either. This is funny. What's my brain going to be blown? De Mor- Th- this because is, this is the mind blow. Uh, because you literally don't need an or and you don't need an if then. You can do everything with and statements. Sure. So, well, I mean, it gets complicated when you try to remove the or, but it, the either I didn't take a shower or I am wet becomes it is false that both I didn't not take a shower and I'm not wet. De, De Morgan's was like the simplifying principle for like all of our probability work this year. Um, so that's a, anyway, that's fascinating. You, they're taught that as a part of your logic class also. Yeah, okay. it's essentially a way to distribute a negative in logic. Yeah. So it's uh, if for a, a simplified version is it is false that I'm going with both Jennifer and Cassandra, right to the prom. So therefore, I either didn't go with Jennifer or I didn't go with Cassandra. Gotcha. Right. So I can turn it from an and to an or by distributing that negative, but also flipping it from an and to an or. So you can, uh, my point is that you can get rid of logical operators, thus making something more, more simple as far as operators concerned by making your language a little bit more complex. So it's just a, it's one of these things where I can prove that an if then statement is nothing more than a complex or statement. Yep. Right. I like it. All right, you've been listening to uh, <laughs> classical stuff you should know, I guess. Uh, no, are, are you the donkey? Do I need to take a <laughs> Is this what's going on? Is that the, uh, the backbreaker? What's, is... what's the final point? Oh, uh, Donaldson's still ahead. He started with eight. Nice. It's almost an insurmountable uh, um, six to four. I'm assuming uh, that, are you? Are we putting things on the YouTube page? We, I mean, yes. Okay. We're currently behind, but we'll get there oh, eventually. Sure. Well, eventually we're putting stuff on YouTube. Um, but anyway, this has been classical stuff you should know. Um, what a promise. We're going to continue <laughs> this conversation in the Patreon after episode where things get spicy. Um, and you can email us, email us at, no wait, the guys at classicalstuff.net. You can find us on Twitter where I will like things that you say to me. Um, well, you guys don't do anything on Twitter. Um, When's the last time you posted on Twitter? I post sometimes when no. we have episodes. Um, I think it's I don't been, know. I think it's been a while. I don't post very much. Okay. Um, Twitter is a dangerous place. <laughs> uh, what an endorsement, man. We're just killing it. <laughs> Someday we'll put stuff on YouTube. We might tweet at you, but we're not really going to commit can, to it. We post we, a lot on Patreon. So we that's post a lot on Patreon. Yeah. You can come look yeah, at really classicalstuff.net where we have pictures next to our episodes. And um, <laughs> really the best place to listen to us is on the podcast. But you already know that, don't right. you? Because here you Anyway, are. thanks for listening. You guys are amazing. And... Um, See you next week. Bye.